Good, e uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Brian Zablekis. I'm on the board of directors for Big Brothers Big Sisters of Central Florida. I've been a big for the past 12 years. I was also uh, formerly a little brother who had the pleasure of being adopted by my big sister and big, uh, big brother in the program. So this program means the absolute world to me. So I want to thank you for joining us uh, during our conversation this evening. Uh, we have a great panel of speakers you know, going from our CEO, Glenn Marie, to the Chief of Police of Melbourne, Florida, uh, David Gillespie. So this conversation this evening is going to be about, you know, everything that's going cur on currently in the news. Uh, we had a lot of questions from our littles and our bigs about um, everything going on and how to handle the situation. So we've brought in uh, some local law enforcement from, you know, Central Florida, from Austin, Texas. We brought in some educators uh, in the Melbourne Cocoa Beach area. And we've also brought in an attorney motivational speaker to have a really good conversation about, you know, how teenagers and young adults um, and littles in our program can uh, respond to everything going on. So I want to welcome uh, first Glenn Marie with me. And uh, from there, we'll start getting into the questions that our littles have. And if you have any questions uh, throughout the evening, please put them in the comments and um, I can relay them to the panel. Hey, Glenn, how you doing? Hey, Ryan, how are you? I'm doing great. I'm doing great. I'm, uh, thanks. Thanks for joining. I know, uh, you know, this started with a conversation on Saturday. Um, luckily, the rest of this panel here uh, on Friday mm -hmm. nights, we do a, a great story time uh, for the kids on the Hey Blue page and the Verdi School and the Big Brothers Big Sisters page. Mm -hmm. um, so we we address the younger youth and uh, get that going with, you know, the officers. So now it's, it's time to focus on the, the older you know, portion of our, our of our program. So if you want to talk a little bit more about what we do and the Bigs and Blue program in particular. Yeah, so Big Brothers, Big Sisters, we're a one-to-one -one mentoring organization. Um, we are in all 50 states, but here in Central Florida, we cover Orange, Osceola, Brevard, Lake, and Seminole counties. Um, we match youth between the ages of 6 to 16. Um, and if all goes well, matches can stay open until the little graduates from high school. Um, there is a national initiative with Big Brothers Big Sisters called Bigs and Blue or Bigs and Badges, depending on the area that you're in. And that program is geared to strengthen the 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 community and the the area that police officers work in. And so we really want to bridge that gap between police officers and the kids and the communities that they serve. You know, this is truly a heartbreaking time, and we're so thankful for the officers that have, you know, come come on here to this evening um, to answer questions and to have real conversation and to the officers that we currently have in our Bigs and Blue program who are really trying to fight to make sure that the kids are seen and they excel and um, they are truly fighting to defend the potential of all the kids um, in our program and in the Orlando and all the communities that we serve. So thank you first to the, your office, to those officers and to people who are um who want um equality and for all the the future generations so thank you um to all of you brave men and women and and children who are doing that um so thank you all for tuning in and i hope you you can enjoy you can enjoy this conversation that's excellent thank you glenn um so the first person i want to bring in is uh, officer bohannon at because he's actually on duty right now. So he's very <laughs> gracious to be joining us right now. So uh, Officer Bohannon, do you wanna uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, you know what you do in the community in your area? You're an absolute rock star on social media with TikTok <laughs> and Instagram. So uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Uh, appreciate it, Brian. Glenn, thank you guys so much for um, having me on tonight. Um, it's a very uh, important topic and an important situation. and. Um, I'm just happy to be a part of this um, today. So um, I'm Officer Jeremy Bohannon with the Austin Police Department. Uh, I've been in law enforcement for 12 years. Um, I've ever since the beginning, I've always understood the importance of creating positive encounters and positive interactions um, with youth and the community. Um, and so when I was given the opportunity, I was actually blessed with the opportunity um, by Chief Art Acevedo, who you might have seen screaming um, passionately at protesters uh, over this weekend in Houston. Um, he was my chief and um, he, he really uh, pushed me um, into, you know, this community policing realm to where, um, you know, making sure that kids that look like me um, have a voice and, and they feel comfortable um, around people in uniform. So um, that's kind of been my platform, um, just trying to change the narrative, um, not only in the community, but also within my police department. 
Um, I'm very passionate about policing. Um, I know the great things that policing can do for communities, um, but I also know the trauma and I know the history. Um, and I know um, that there is a, a, a large uh, piece of understanding that needs to be had by police officers. So I wanna thank you guys for having me on and um, I'm excited. No, thank you, Jeremy. I really appreciate you taking the time. I knew, uh, you know, you basically up all night last night. So thank you for joining us. No problem. All right. Then uh, next up on our list is uh, I'm absolutely excited to introduce him. So is the chief of police of Melbourne, Florida, uh, David Gillespie. So you know we've never met before until tonight. So the fact that he took the time out of his busy schedule as chief of police uh, for a very large area to join us, you know, uh, so I'll introduce him right now. So thank you. Thank you, sir, for joining us. Uh, thank you for having me, uh, Brian and Glenn. I appreciate the opportunity to participate tonight. Yeah, of course. I want to ask you the same thing, a, a little bit about yourself and, you know, what kind of things do you do in the communities to, to serve your Melbourne uh, area? Certainly. So uh, I've been in law enforcement for 31 years. I've been chief of police here in Melbourne for the last three. Uh, prior to that, I served 28 years with Montgomery County Police in Maryland. Uh, just outside of Washington, D.C. And first community department, uh, and then again for the last three years I've been here. Uh, one of the things that I can tell you that is important, and it goes right to the crux of everything that police officers do, and that is to have the faith and trust from the community that we serve. And that is, comes in a lot of different forms. It comes through uh, having relationships, and having the ability to actually talk to people at low levels in, in community meetings. I can tell you for myself, when people call me to meet with the chief, my answer is always, yeah, I rarely tell people no because I want to hear what they have to say. And I think it's very important for us to get that feedback, regardless of whether it's positive or negative or favorable or not. And so I can tell you that we spend a lot of time in our community making sure that we are making inroads and having a genuine relationship. And then the other piece is trying to get an agency, and in law enforcement, it's very difficult in certain communities, but to really have an agency that reflects the community that we serve. You know, we want to be able to diversify our workforce, and I think that's critical. As we really look to do outreach, we need to reflect the people that we serve. Otherwise, there's just a natural disconnect and I think that creates just innate problems in and of itself. And so um, that's one of the things I think is most critical is to have conversations, tough conversations, and not be defensive about the way things are done, but to be open and really take a look at what other people are saying and what's meaningful to the community. And then being able to roll it out and, and have your officer really do the job the right way. That's excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Chief David. I really appreciate you joining us. Um, so we're going to introduce the, you know, the next speaker, and then I'll I'll be bringing everybody in um, after we get the intros done, and we'll be going from there. So thank you, sir. Appreciate it. All right. So our next up is uh, one of my favorite people. I wish I had even the, like a quarter of the amount of energy that John has. He is the ultimate hype man of all yes. hype men. Uh, he's an absolute blast. He lights up every room that he walks into. Um, I met him at a, an event last year that was a you know, police officers and community uh, relations here in Orlando. It was a great event. And, uh, you know, John, John has a great story himself, uh, you know, retired NYPD. And uh, he and his wife, uh, Ayana, run a beautiful school out in Melbourne, uh, very hands-on, great learning experience. So uh, I want to introduce the, uh, the Verity family. Hi, everybody. Thank you hey. so much for tuning in tonight. Thank you for the beautiful words, Brian. Great to see you, Glen Marie. Hey. Yes. Um, so I'm gonna let my wife first. Ladies first. Uh, yeah. Please, always, after you. always throw me in the fire. <laughs> first. Well, hi, I'm Ayana Verdi. Uh, I am the founder of the Verdi Eco School. The Verdi Eco School is an urban farm school that uses the community of the O'Galley Arts District here in Melbourne, Florida, as a campus. So our roots are very deep within our community and we're very, very much invested in ensuring that the connections that we have to our local organizations, our local 
businesses, and of course our local police department are positive, um, and that we give room for our own community, our school family to heal when necessary. So these kinds of conversations are super important for us, for our students, for our families. Um, and certainly with this gentleman here who made it his life's work to, to create positive connections between police departments and and the community. Yes, right yes. So um, I am the founder of the Hey Blue Initiative through the Verde Eco School. And um, that's the purpose. The purpose is to build meaningful connections between police departments and the communities that they are that they serve. And mm -hmm. um, we do that through uh, many different ways. But as you all hopefully have tuned in to see, <laughs> um, one of the ways that we do is do a, an amazing story time every uh, Friday night at 6.45 p.m., uh, where we bring police officers and community members from across the United States together to read books, um, sing songs, and have a bubble party. Mm -hmm. And those books are all about uh, celebrating diversity, representation, but it's also about compassion. It's about unity. It's about love. And these are all key things that we need right now to, to help us come together and to understand and to um, forge on, you know? So I appreciate you having us on tonight, Brian and Ms. Glenn Marie. And, um, yeah. and I'm so thankful to be with Alton, with Jeremy and with the chief on, on this awesome call tonight. No, thank you guys. Um, so you already segue, segued me into the next speaker. So, uh, I want to thank you for doing that. So the next one is uh, Mr. Alton uh, Edmond, who is a attorney and uh, motivational speaker, and probably one of the most fierce pe people that I know out there. Uh, <laughs> is an absolute pleasure. Uh, one of you know his book is an absolute blast to be you know read on our story time on Fridays, uh, as mm -hmm. everyone in our group chat over here starts yelling fierce. fierce. So uh, <laughs> Mr. Edmond. How you doing, Fierce! sir? Fierce! What's going on? <laughs> <laughs> Alton Edmund here. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, participate and be a part of this. Um, I think it is a beautiful thing um, to have um, this uh, conversation to, um, to really just have an opportunity to be transparent about uh, what's going on in the world and what we can do um, to make it better. Uh, that's really what it's all about. Um, I am an attorney. I own my own law practice. I'm a motivational speaker. I own my own motivational speaking company. I am a college professor at the local college, Eastern Florida State College. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I'm also on the board for Emma Jewel Charter Academy, which is the logo you see here. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I do a lot of other things in the community in terms of activism. And, and in fact, I am uh, on the planning committee for a uh, a protest that's coming up on Saturday morning uh, here in Rockledge and Coco. So I'm looking forward to um, an opportunity to peacefully um, express some of the different concerns and raise awareness for the issues that are going on in the world and the things that uh, that we're here to discuss and uh, talk about solutions for this evening. That's awesome. Thank you so much. I really appreciate everything you do in the community. You're you're an absolute blast to be around and you know talk to via email and everything. So. Um, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually bring everybody in and uh, welcome everybody to the chat. So I'm going to ask the first question, and it's just going to be an open round table. Uh, this one is directly towards more th to the officers um, or former officer in John's case. So the littles were curious and the bigs were, were curious, you know, what type of cultural div diversity training do officers have to undergo? And I know that may vary throughout the country. And it's actually great that we have a wide range, you know, John with you in New York, uh, Officer Jeremy, you in, in Texas, and then uh, Chief David, you here in Florida, you know, what kind of di cultural diversity training is actually taught in the academy for, for officers? Uh, Chief David, if you'd like to go first, or actually, uh, Jeremy, if you'd like to go first, just in case you have to get cut off early since you're on duty. Um, <laughs> I'm good. I, I got at least 20 until I start for sure. So go oh, ahead, okay, Chief. Perfect. Right, Chief yeah, go, go ahead, ahead sir. <laughs> All right. So uh, in the academy, as you said, officers will get uh, several hours of cultural diversity training in the academy. Uh, that's very small snippet of what they need to be effective in carrying out their duties. And it's in addition to the training, we also look at cultural competency so that officers really understand, not just learn from a textbook, but they understand and practice what are different 
cultures, what's important, how do people behave, what, you know, different things mean different things to different people. And so in addition to the uh, initial training in the academy, they also receive training as a requirement from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement every four years at in-service training. But I will tell you that the requirements are the bare bones. That's the minimums. We don't want to reach the minimums. We want to go well beyond. And what we have to do and what we, we implement is a system that diversity training is something that's incorporated in everything that we do. Not like leadership, too. You want people to understand it at all levels of the organization. And so when we have an opportunity to do training scenarios, we incorporate the cultural diversity in that. So we want the repetition. We want people to see it and recognize it and understand it so they can make wise decisions and, and second nature. It's not something that they have to think about. And then, again, you learn that because you have a diverse organization. When you have a diverse organization, again, your person to your left, the person to your right may not look like you, but you learn from each other. And I can say that from experience working in a diverse community with diverse officers. And I, I can tell you that it, the impact of that is great because what you see is how much we are all alike, how we are all very similar as opposed to focusing on the differences when you don't really put yourself in that environment. Mm -hmm. so I think it's more than just the training, more than just the minimums. It's about incorporating cultural diversity in everything we do. And then what we will also do is we'll train our supervisors. We'll bring in experts into the field. Uh, we have, uh, there's a number of different things with 21st century policing and de-escalation training, um, use of force training, where all this diversity is important to incorporate those in that dynamic type situation. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll, um, I'll echo with, with Chief. Um, you know, we do all those things, and I, you know, each state has different mandates. Um, so we do have cultural diversity training, um, and and pretty much echo everything that Chief said. Um, those trainings are great, um, but they just scratch the surface. Mm -hmm. um, so what we also do uh, here, um, uh, implicit bias training, uh, which I absolutely love. Um, you know, it's it's one of those things where. You know, as long as you kind of understand that you may have a bias, whether it be um, for race or gender or, you know, a, a socioeconomic status or, you know, a color blue, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, then at least you understand that and you don't allow that bias to um, dictate, how, dictate how you police or how you treat people. And so if you're aware of, of, of what's going on with you, then you won't project that out uh, when you're out dealing with the community. Um, other things that, that we do, um, you know, we, we talk a lot about racial profiling, um, mm -hmm. what it means, what it stands for, um, how we report it, um, and how we make sure that, you know, uh, when we make stops, like, are we being fair? Are we, um, are we, you know, doing it, um, just because of the, the way the person looks or their color, or, or do we have an offense or, you know, and stuff like that. So, uh, training is really important. Um, like I said, it still scratches the surface. There's still a lot of other things. And since we're on that topic of training, one thing, um, I know at some point we'll get to solutions, but just in case I don't get off, um, mm -hmm. one thing that I've really been talking talking about and harping on is making sure that um, everybody in law enforcement at least understands the history of policing um, viewed from the communities that they police. Um, and that's, a, that's something that I feel like is missing um, in a lot of academies uh, for new officers coming in. Um, you know, we get the history um, that the textbooks have, um, but, mm -hmm. you know, we don't get um, the, the long history of, of Jim Crow laws of who was enforcing that, who was enforcing, um, you know, when Martin Luther King was peacefully protesting, who, who was, was out there when, uh, you know, they were stopping it and saying it was wrong. You know, it was always mm -hmm. this uniform. And so that officers today understand because, you know, there's a lot, a lot of great officers that have great hearts that mean well, that don't even understand why they're receiving some of the things and some of the words that they're getting. And I, I try to let them know, look, it's not you personally, it's the uniform that you represent. And so when, when people start understanding that, then they'll be a little bit more open to be like, okay, I understand now, how do I change the narrative for them? So. Mm -hmm. Good point. John? So I think it's important for everybody to understand as well, you know, I, I have a lot of more time on than, than the other officers, you know, well, maybe close to Chief Gillespie. And when I went through the academy, and now you're talking about 1997, 
there was nowhere near as much um, cultural diversity training and, and, and any in any way. They literally said, you know, these are the type of people that you might encounter where you go to work. And, um, you know, machismo was rampant, you know, and you're just like, what? You know, at, at the time, you just look at them like, you know, there has to be more. Mm -hmm. My diversity training was when I went and worked at, in all of the different precincts in, that New York City had to offer and to get out and start talking to people. And that was the best thing that I was able to do to understand, to start to understand, you know? And I'm so happy that Chief Gillespie here in, in Melbourne and also, um, you know, Officer Bahannon in Austin, Texas, that this is, this is stuff that's come out now and that they are sitting there and they're making it a priority for every officer to understand not one point, but numerous points, numerous points throughout their career. Super, super important. Yeah, that's great. I I definitely echo yeah, everything it, you guys say. <laughs> yeah, that was great, especially you know, here in here in the history behind of where things used to be and where things are progressing. Uh, is is extremely important, uh, especially what you know, Officer Bahana was saying about you know you have to remember where things were 50, 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's still people who remember those days and we're trying to change that. And you're trying to change that every day. You know, you know, Chief David, I know for a fact that you're, you're pushing these new initiatives very hard over in Melbourne and, you know, trying to change the the mindset of everyone. So it's, it's really, really important. Now I'm going to bring everybody back in now um, as this, as this question is for everybody. And this question actually came from my former littles. They're in college now. Um, they wanted to know, you know, how can mental health and self care be addressed um, in police departments, but also not just police departments, but in you know, communities that don't really have access to uh, mental health facilities because they don't have you know health care or you know the the money to go spend at the you know at, at these facilities. So, you know, what can yeah. be done on the officer side of you know mental health for you know mental health checks, mental health evaluations, and then also on the, the community side of you know you know the stress of you know everyday life that could you know inflict a lot of these issues. So, um, we'll start at our bottom left. Uh, Mr. Edmund, if you'd like to get started, that'd be, that'd be you know, phenomenal. Sounds good. Um, you know, I think uh, one of one of the important things is that um, in policing, uh, people in uh, Chief Gillespie's position have the opportunity to um, bargain, to participate in collective bargaining agreements um, with unions about, you know, about the different the different requirements and different um, policies that are implemented and uh, that their officers must follow. I think that um, adding uh, mandatory quarterly mental health evaluations um, is is something that, you know, it could be an easy solution for law enforcement, um, something that would most likely be covered by the benefits that they already have, so they wouldn't really have to pay for it, um, and something that I believe could be beneficial. Um, in terms of the community as a whole, I think it's important that we as a community work first before anything else, um, because I know that affordability, healthcare, those are major overarching nationwide issues that are very difficult to address on a larger scale. Um, but I think uh, on a smaller level, we can work to remove the stigma of mental health counseling um, mm -hmm in our own communities, in our own businesses, um, in our own homes. Um, because uh, in a lot of communities, there is definitely a stigma um, mm -hmm. as it relates to mental health counseling, especially in minority um, communities. Um, and so it, it's very important to first remove that stigma um, and to allow people to, uh, to believe that uh, it's okay. Uh, just like you need to work out so that your muscles are healthy, just like you need to eat right so that your body is healthy. Um, uh, it's important to make sure that you do things to keep your mind healthy. Um, because when you have a healthy mind, um, you are more effective in every area of your life. 100%. Uh, Chief, Chief David, is, what what do you think about the stresses of being an officer and you know, the mental health um, of your officers on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, I think the mental health of uh, law enforcement it has to be of paramount concern. 
if you look at just this year, things off through the whole COVID pandemic. And then now we're going into you know, what's happening in the street. Right? There's a lot of uh, press allegations and, and threats that now add officers. They're out on the front lines of COVID. They're out on the front lines of some of these protests uh, that are so it's important for us to be able to recognize those stresses. That's in addition to the cumulative effect of you know, unbelievable scenes, very gruesome situations that most people just don't see or really understand and the impact. That and that we have to get from a number, a number of different ways to address. It. One is we have to be able to have like EAP. They have to have a way out. So that's a formal way so they can go get psychiatric counseling. And now, even in today's world, for uh, you know, a police officer, there is still somewhat of a stigma to do that. Mm-hmm. So people are a little bit up law enforcement with peer support. That is other civilians that work for the department that will reach out to the officer after a critical and stressful event and debrief and kind of do a, a quick check as to where they are mentally. And then you have officers that get involved in, you know, some significant impact. And they're, and so they also have to deal with that and come to terms with the things they have to do, the actions they have to take. And if you look at police suicide in this country, it's one of the, the, the things that has really increased over the last several years. And a lot of officers are dying as a result of suicide. And so how do we do that? How do we, we prevent that? It, it's got to have that tight knit um, ability for supervisors to be able to check in on their people, mm-hmm. be able to respond to professionals. We also have a chaplaincy program. Most agencies do so that you have somebody that you can go to spiritually uh, right away after an incident. And so we incorporate all these things in there for our officers to be able to have access to. And what we do in our debriefs is we invite peer support in, or we'll invite the chat in, because the officer will not ask for it. But if you bring them there, then they're, they're able to actually have um, some interaction with them. And so I think as we go forward, uh, we have to be mindful of the stressors and the, the issues and the impact of the job and, and society on the officers and then really have a, a, a focused way for us to be able to help them repeat. Um, like Alton was saying, to have to eat eating habits, you know, working out and, and have other outs. The other thing is a good sense of humor. You know, you have to, you know, it's very difficult to just digest all that stuff and then once you're done that incident, you got to, you know, write report and go right back out on the street and you're handling something completely different. It really defies logic for what some of the officers, we expect a lot out of them. We're up for the We'll continue to find ways to be able to address uh, suicide and the mental impact. Seem to lost it at the end there, uh, Chief David. Um, excellent points for sure. Uh, Officer Brahannon, you know, you're you're working the riots and the protests and everything right now. Uh, you know, how how are you functioning with uh, mental health on your on your side, and uh, how do you see the Austin Police Department uh, handling officer mental health? Um, you know, mental mental health is a, a tough thing because you don't. You know, you, you, unless you check up on your friends and your buddies and make sure they're doing OK, you really don't know. You know, um, officers, um, we do probably too good of a job of not showing our emotion uh, when we're out there. And so um, really, the biggest thing is just checking up. Like I sent about six or seven text messages early today just just to check on some of my friends, just make sure that they're good to go, you know, make sure everything's good um, through Facebook. You know, we have a um, Facebook page and everybody's kind of checking up. Hey, how's everybody doing? Um, just to kind of see what's going on, the pulse, because um, we know it's, it's, it's very stressful times uh, when we uh, sw- everybody had to switch their schedules and they, they did an all call page on us on Saturday um, when people, you know, had vacations planned and holidays planned and birthdays and everything else. And you had already worked a long week and were ready to take their day off. 
um, and to, hey, we need all hands on deck. So so get your gear and, and get ready to come back in. And um, so those things take their, take its toll, um, not only as a police officer and being out there and being yelled at and, and feeling like the world is against you, um, but then also at home, uh, you know, when you have a family and you have kids that don't understand why when you just got home and you're just waking up that you have to leave again, um, you know, to go back out there and, and get in front of people that, you know, that from what they see on TV, um, that, 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 ma that might not like you right now. And, um, so that's a tough thing to like internalize. Um, and it's really about like what chief was saying, how we have these, uh, peer support. We have full-time, uh, we have uh, full-time peer support officers, um, who check up They're in every region of our, of our, um, department. Uh, we have a whole bunch of chaplains. I think we have like six or seven chaplains in our department. Um, that they ride with us, they're out there with us, uh, praying for us. And um, so we have those things put in place. Um, but the stigma, like Alton was saying, that stigma is there and um, it's hard to use that or it's hard to, uh, to, to, to go and do it and admit that you have um, something that you need to talk about, you know. And so um, kind of switching over to the community side, that's kind of when, I, you know, with social media and why I like to go talk to, to students. Uh, when I go to students and I, I actually took a survey over December and I asked, hey, what's the biggest issue um, at your school? And I did this in four schools um, in Austin in high school. And number one for every single one of them was mental health issues. Um, you know, it was mental health issues and bullying. Um, and so, you know, what I do when I go in and I speak to kids, I try to make it fun um, and I try to make mental health um, something that's OK to talk about and something that's OK to reach out to people. And if you're feeling any type of way to make sure you make sure you have somebody that you trust, it doesn't have to be your parents. It doesn't have to be, you know, it could be anybody. And if you don't have anybody, you reach out to me, Officer Bohannon. That's why I have my social media pages for people to come to me if they have questions or if they need help or they need something and I'll be there for them. And what I also do with that is I, I make it fun. One, number one. Um, but then I also uh, make sure that whatever they're consuming, uh, through social media, on their phone, whatever, because everybody's got their phones in their hands. Make mm -hmm. sure whatever they're consuming is positive. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I asked a girl one time, like she told me she was sad and on over Instagram DM. And I, she told me you know, she's sad and she's always depressed. She doesn't know why. And I asked her a simple question. I said, what do you listen to? And she gave me three artists that I know are, you know, talk about mental health, but it's always on the sad side. So I gave her some recommendations to listen to something a little more upbeat, something happy. Um, and she reported to me the next day that made me feel so much better. Um, and so it's just little things like that, that we kind of have to think outside of the box um, and take that stigma away and just try to help people um, promote positivity at every chance you possibly can get. Um, and that I feel like that is something that could help the community and police officers. That's amazing. Yeah, it's a big mm -hmm. issue that we find with our littles. And I, I do follow you on uh, social media and you are always positive, 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 and you do respond very quickly. Um, so, yes, yeah, thank, thank you, Officer Bohannon, um, for you know, everything you do, because you are an absolute pleasure on social media. Um, but so then, uh, John, um, you you have I think you and I bonded uh, very quickly because of our stories of our past and, you know, what, what's happened to us. It, in our future lives or past lives. And I, uh, you know, how, how has mental health as an officer, you know, affected you and your, your day, day to day life. And then also like, how did you overcome that? And then, you know, what helped your department you know, after nine 11 and other, all those really bad instances. So the greatest thing for me, I mean, yes, I, I am a, uh, nine 11 survivor, first responder. Um, and that was obviously a tremendously traumatic experience. But even before that, being a police officer, being an active police officer, you are constantly, like the chief said, and like Jeremy said, and like Alton said, you're constantly being met with these instances where they are like, you have to bring this stuff home with you. And this is some serious, serious stuff that normal people just don't have a grasp on. Like everyday people don't have a grasp on, you know? And it's like, you know, the one thing that I always did was I always sought out connection. That was the biggest thing for me. That's what, what my coping mechanism was. I always, when I was on patrol, I always sought out after uh, people in the community to talk to and to find out more about their lives. And like Jeremy said, interact and, and just sit there and, and help in any way that I can, even if it's using these 
before using this, even if it's, it's just showing a ton of patience, that's what, um, that's what connection is all about. So now, here we are, fast forward, now that um, I'm the co-founder of the Verde Eco School with my wife, and now we have uh, about 85 students, it is extremely more resonant now. And I'll let my wife chime in a little bit of, about what we're doing in the school and, and practices like that. Yeah, and, and to John's point, there is this heaviness that police officers carry with them. You know, similar to some other professions where there are higher rates of burnout, higher rates of suicide. These are our givers in society. These, these are the people that give so much of themselves and often don't have enough to take back in. You know, so building community around these individuals, these individuals need connection in order to be filled. So we do this, you know, Jeremy, similarly in, in the way that you spoke about in Alton, what you do at M. Jewel is that we work with students we work within schools to start this idea that mental health begins now, it begins when you're in kindergarten, it begins before kindergarten. It, it's filling yourself with positivity, teaching yourself some coping mechanisms so that mm -hmm. you don't have to wait to explode before you're dealing with something that is profound for you within you. Um, and oftentimes our police officers us as individuals, as adults, have not learned these coping mechanisms that we need to positively filter these awful things that are happening within our world. You know, even just mm -hmm. as an individual watching videos on Facebook, you know, what's happening in our country now, it's traumatic. Mm -hmm. How many of us have a proper coping mechanism? How many of us are able to unplug, put that down, take some breaths, walk away, connect to somebody positive? And so now you move into police departments with individuals who maybe don't even know that language, it, who are asking, who are being asked to show strength. And sometimes this idea of strength with vulnerability don't mix. I, I can't be strong if I'm vulnerable. I can't be strong yeah. if I talk to somebody. I can't connect to people in the community. Then they might think I'm weak. You know, so there's this incredible stigma surrounding the idea of getting healthy, being healthy in your mind before you can impress upon anyone else or model for anyone else their health. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And then like, it, yeah, hundred percent, even as a guy, it's really hard to admit, you know, you're vulnerable. They're trying to, you know, get into us. You know, now it's admitting that you're vulnerable is a strength now, you know, being able to admit that you need help is a strength now. Um, so then Glenn, can you, you speak a little bit about um, what we're doing for our littles and mental health and, for our parents and the littles and the bigs yeah so um we're an organization that we talk a lot about mental health um and you know we try to break that stigma a lot of uh the youth that we serve and the families in our program are minorities so um you know like it's previously been said there is that stigma in a lot of minority communities and we want to we want to break that stigma sometimes People will take their kids to the doctor. They have, you know, they get diagnosed with ADHD, but then that follow-up therapy that's needed as well um, to learn those coping mechanisms and things like that is not always done. So we always try to empower the parent, let them know, hey, this is okay, you know, because let's, your child was diagnosed with ADHD. You know, that doesn't mean that they have to be on a pill forever. You know, of course, every child is different, but, you know, we want to empower the parent to seek out what else they can do to provide for their child. Um, and so those are some of the things that we do. We also understand that not all parents, you know, have that, you know, luxury to have the health insurance or to be able to afford counseling. And so sometimes it's just finding what what helps you cope with things. You know, is it, you know, reading for, you know, 15 minutes a day? Is it, you know, going outside and walking? Um, so I think as adults, we have to find what what helps us cope with these stressful situations. You know, I can't imagine, you know, so many parents, they're having to work, but then they have their kids at home and then they're also having to be teachers for their kids right now. So it's a very high, high in demand situation. And then imagine if you're also, you know, not just working, but you're also a nurse, a police officer, a doctor, where there's just so much going on around you. You have to learn 
those proper coping mechanisms. And everyone is different. Everyone has their own way of dealing with stress and anxiety. And so if you aren't able to talk to someone right now, um, you know, it could be, you know, a friend, it could be, you know, a, a, a pastor, anything like that, um, you know, prayers. Um, but, you know, some people I know enjoy writing. So even having a journal, I know that I used to write a lot. I used to have a journal, um, you know, and that helped me out a lot, you know, and I know it may sound, may sound a little weird, but, you know, even nowadays, I just, sometimes I just kind of have conversations with myself where I'm like, okay, well, Glenn, this is what, you know, this is, this is the situation. What are you going to do? And you kind of sometimes have to be your own hype man or hype woman um, to get you through that next step. So you can then go ahead and encourage others. So um, that's, that's one of the biggest things, just coping, finding out, you know, what your child, um, how they can cope best and, and yourself as well. Glenn Marie, if you have a person, you let me know. <laughs> Just to let you know, John, after the the story time on Friday, I had about three texts and said, like, John is like the best hype man. Is it the same one? Thank you. That's awesome, guys. Thank you so much for the for the responses to that. So our our next question is about you know how the community and the police departments can uh, collaborate to actually work together to better the relationship, but also better the communities, um, which therefore make the officer's jobs easier if the communities are safer and people are more responsive to the officer. So you know, what, what ways do you think are the best for the community and the officers to work together to actually build a better relationship and therefore build a better community um, overall? Um, officer uh, Bohannon, we'll, we'll start with you this time. I saw some of your uh, your coworkers, yeah, some of your friends jump in coming, with they're you. Coming, they're rolling in, they're rolling in. <laughs> um, you know, um, you know, and, and, and it's kind of funny because, you know, I'm, I'm seeing a lot of stuff now with everything going on. And, you know, um, I think now people are starting to understand the importance of the community relations. And um, yeah, that, that's my cue for my start. Uh, people are starting <laughs> to understand the importance of the dialogue and the community relationships that we're building um, you know, I've been doing this for a very long time. And although my department is really good and we do a lot of things um, in the community, uh, there's a lot of things that we can do better. Um, you know, and, and one thing that I would say, especially since, you know, I have uh, Chief Gillespie here, um, you know, especially for, for uh, at, at the top, it's like empower your officers to get out there and do as much as they possibly can that is not in an enforcement capacity. Um, whether it be um, reading to kids at schools, whether it be, um, you know, going down to the local uh, boys and girls clubs or the big brothers and big sisters and get involved in that stuff. Um, doing things and immersing yourself in the community is one of the most important things we can do. Um, and I'll leave with this. Um, you know, I was I was in an Uber, an Uber ride one day and um, the driver um, you know, he's telling me a story, you know, we we're talking about the Dallas Cowboys and he's like, man, I was a huge Dallas Cowboy fan growing up. Um, it was a, a, around the time when they were around Austin, there in San Antonio doing their, um, mini camps. And, uh, this guy, he's like, Nate Newton was my favorite player of all time. And there was nothing more that I wanted than an autograph from Nate Newton. And he went and, uh, you know, he said he stood in line and, um, he got to the end and he said, Nate Newton just got up and he just walked off. He didn't say, he didn't even look at me. He didn't smile. And he was like, I was the hugest Cowboy fan. And now I'm an Eagles fan because of that one moment. And that stuck with me when he said that, because I know that as a kid, if somebody gave me a smile or a sticker or a lollipop and they were in uniform, that, that could change my whole perspective on them. And, you know, Nate Newton basically lost a career Cowboy fan because he didn't smile and look at him and nothing, nothing, you know, this is, I hope Nate Newton doesn't see this and get mad at me. <laughs> it was just a, you know, and it just, it just stuck with me, man. And, and, you know, and, and that's my philosophy, you know, like I never lose an opportunity um, to create that positive uh, encounter for somebody. Cause you don't know how many encounters they're going to get. You don't know how many negative ones they've had. Um, but if you fill them up with positivity and positive encounters and, and, and good things, and they know that they can trust you, and that you're there to protect them, um, then that's where I see um, things are changing. And we just need more officers involved in that and remembering that they are servants of their community um, and not there as enforcers. 
hundred percent. First impressions last a lifetime for sure. You know, um, Officer Behandon, I'll definitely let you go if you do need to go. It sounds like yeah, uh, I have to go. Your um, I appreciate you guys. Thank you so so much Thank for having you. me on the panel. Um, everybody, be safe and uh, let's just keep thinking of ways that we can make this world better. This world better, and uh, yes. I'm, I'm all for it. So thanks for having me on, guys. Thank no, you. thank you, and stay safe out there this evening. All right, take care. See ya. Bye. Safe. All right, that was awesome. That was a great response from uh, Officer Bohannon. Uh, Chief David, can you uh, sp speak a little bit more of what uh, what he said and a little bit what what you guys are doing in Mil uh, Melbourne? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I, I think that you know he really hit home. You know, with the ability to say that every interaction matters, and it might be one interaction of 20 for an officer but that to that person you're interacting with it might be their only encounter with law enforcement in their lifetime mm -hmm. so they're going to remember it a whole lot more probably than we are and so you want to leave them with a positive impression especially at times you know and opportunities for us to be able to build that bridge build that trust so i'll back and say it has to come from the top the department philosophy has to embrace community police and the ability to reach out to officers and empower them to have time out of their day to do community policing projects and problem solving. And that means if you're going to go to a Hey Blue school in the morning with John Verde, then we have to allow them the time to do that. So there's a commitment there, right? So that has to come from the top. And I think as you, know, as you go forward, there's so many different opportunities. We have SROs in the school. We have our community resource officers here. Uh, last year, they did this new project, and it was a day where we cut 200 kids in the community. We went to a local park, and we had a big expedition to train them and how to fix We gave them <laughs> donated businesses, and they oh went out outside, and they were fishing into the river. And awesome. great feedback that we got from something so simple but really left an impact. And it was just one of those other examples of a project that's unconventional. It's different than anything mm -hmm. I've of in 31 years, but it worked. It was very successful. And so the other thing we've done is we've taken our, what used to be our special operations division, which was enforcement division. It was SWAT, K, and you know, those uh, things that are, are out there kind of like impactful enforcement oriented. And we moved that to another division in our patrol so that we could free up that opportunity to show the community our priority, which is community services. So that's now our community services division. And so, you know, what we're doing now is we're putting that effort and we're putting the momentum that we've built there into the community. And that means schools, rec centers, churches, working with our faith-based community, because that's another piece I think that's missing throughout and in Melbourne, I've been in the three years I've been here, I've just every time I'm down into, you know, the, the uh, South Brevard area, uh, you know, it, the community is so warm. They're so welcoming and they're so positive. Even when things last night, I'm at a candlelight vigil and it's an uplifting experience because of the prayer and the faith that people are really talking about the hope, not talking about the despair, but talking about the hope. And it makes a big difference. And I think those things and having genuine relationships with people in the community, especially our Hispanic community, our Latina community, our African-American community, absolutely important for us to have a genuine uh, relationship that they see where your heart is. They see mm -hmm. what they want to understand. Our community wants to understand what type of officer are you hiring mm -hmm. and how training them and then they want to know how are you holding them accountable because there's times when we have to do all three right and so that's the component that we work for is to kind of encapsulate that but continue to work with our community and we're talking about the the, the youth from preschool and 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 uh, hashtag hey blue and reading time all the way up to young adults because they need it and mm -hmm. our our communities sometimes that need us the most, sometimes want us the least. And I'm fortunate in a community here in Melbourne where they welcome the police in their neighborhood. They want us there. And if we're not there enough and handling some of the issues, they're asking me, Chief, we need you over here to address this problem. 
and we'll do that. And, and that's the type of relationship we have. The other thing that we do here in Melbourne is we have the Community Relations Council meeting, and that's once a month is a town hall meeting. And so uh, the city will rotate it from the north end to the south end every other month. And so that also provides us an opportunity to get feedback you know, from the community. And I think that's so important for us to be able to hear from the community what they see. What are their challenges? What are the things that they need the most help from us on? Because oftentimes we think we know what people are concerned about. But when you sit down and talk to them, they might have a completely different perspective on what's really impacting their world. So the, that's, those are some of the things I think that are important. Uh, I do think and believe, though, that you also have to have the right type of officer in those positions. And I think that's another key because you want people that are going to be able to um, communicate effectively, be compassionate in how they carry out their duties, and be professional. And one of the things I preach to our folks all the time is to be professional, be respectful, and be approachable. There's nothing mm -hmm. worse than somebody coming up to an officer asking for directions or asking to, for a, a question of any sort and kind of getting blown off or getting a cold shoulder and leaving mm -hmm. them with a bad impression. It just doesn't mm -hmm. Well, and that's not what we're about. We're about making every contact meaningful, every contact positive as best we can, and really trying to make a positive difference. And it, it sounds easy, but very difficult. And mm -hmm. that's what down deeper, have a little more patience than maybe we thought we had. Might have to have a little more empathy than we thought we had. But those are the things that make a department, you know, one of the better agencies, because that's what separates you from some of the others. For sure. And a great message from uh, one of our our couple big matches, uh, mm -hmm. Ashley and Alex uh, Asatarian, who I had the pleasure of getting to know at my last job. At, uh, and great, great people, great bigs, and great new parents, too. They're, they're, parents. they're, they're a yeah. five-month-old. Um, you know, thanking everyone there. So, uh, Mr. Edmund, uh, you know, what can you say from the, the community side of, of things and what you see from actually talking to the kids um, you know, without a badge on, I know they, they speak, you know, more candidly, uh, when there's not, a, you know, someone higher up than them, you know, they can talk a little bit more straight. So what, what are you hearing from the children and you know, the teenagers and what do, what's your thoughts on this? Well, uh, you know, in my experience, the community policing really is where it, where it's at. Yeah. And so I, I really echo a lot of the sentiments that have already been expressed. Um, I, growing up, growing up in the community, the really poor and downtrodden community that I grew up in, the only time I really saw law enforcement as a child is when they were coming to take away someone that I knew and cared about. Um, and so as you could imagine, growing up, my, uh, my thoughts about law enforcement as a young person were not very good. Um, but when I began to get to know law enforcement officers in high school and I took law enforcement, they actually had a class when I was in high school um, that was about law enforcement, where I got to spend time with a law enforcement officer um, uh, every day, you know, for that class. Uh, my experience got a lot better. I even remember the school resource officer um, when I was in high school, Officer Woody. Um, and he was a hilarious guy, always joking, laughing, talking. And um, anytime I go back home, he's he's now a teacher. He retired from law enforcement and he's oh, wow. a teacher now. And um, and he invites me to his classroom to speak to his students when I'm back home um, because he remembers me and 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 the type of student I was. And I remember him um, and the type of person he was. Um, and so uh, that relationship exists still today. Um, and so, you know, that community policing um, is incredibly important and um, and and it's essential that people um, see law enforcement um, as regular everyday human beings um, with thoughts, feelings, emotions, families, hobbies, um, and have those connections. As a matter of fact, you know, I can even brag on Chief Gillespie um, and what they do in Melbourne because um, a friend and pastor of mine, Dupree Williams, that I'm sure Chief Gillespie has heard of, um, they do a community cleanup where they go and pick up trash um, once a month um, and law enforcement escorts and assist them um, in the process. Um, and here in Coco, you know, um, I can, I can brag on my own chief of police. Um, when it comes to, um, community policing and working with little kids, um, Coco police department 
is one of the best uh, when it comes to community policing, when it comes to little kids, man. Um, I know that my own chief, uh, Chief Mike Cantaloupe, um, he shows up to Emma Jewel Charter Academy once a month when we do a character <laughs> breakfast um, where we um, where we invite the parents and we award children who have shown positive character traits such as responsibility um, and other uh, different character traits. And uh, you can find pictures all over Facebook <laughs> of, of Chief dressing up in a chef hat, putting on a um, a chef, uh, I, I forget the- what, Apron. What you call it. An apron, apron. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, like a chef apron and uh, and cooking pancakes and, uh, and and eggs and and stuff for the kids and i've done it several times myself um but those positive impacts um every day are the things that that kids need to see and the things that um really make the greatest impact 100 percent. i want to add something real quick so um with our bigs and blue program some of our some of our uh bigs um, who are in law enforcement, they prefer to do this, our site-based program, which is where they see their little at school. And I'll never forget this. One of our bigs said, you know, when he, so he would usually go toward, come in towards the end of the little's lunch. So he'd pick up the little from lunch and then they'd go to the library or something like that. And so when he, at first, when he'd come pick up his little, everyone would be like, ooh, they're incredible. Ooh. And then you know, after a few weeks, they were like, Hey, so and so, that's your big. And then they just, hey, can I get a high five? Can I get a high five? You know, and it was just, you know, just seeing the kids were seeing this person. You know, at first they were like, oh, this person's in trouble. And then they're like, no, this person's cool, you know, asking for high fives and, you know, asking them how their day was. And so that meant a lot um, to the big, you know, they're like, wow, like just in a few weeks, just how they, they, they barely see me. I walk into the lunchroom, I walk out, and, you know, just how quickly that, um, the exchange between um, with, between him and the students changed. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I I remember doing. Oh. That's a great example. You know, I, I used to be when I was in in a, a agency before I came here. One of my SROs went to an elementary school, and it really police there very often. But the principal would ask us if we would bring somebody there, and when they did, the the kid pulled up to the lunch. They all went running. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it was sad when he came back and, you oh. know, story. And, you know, it's really heartbreaking, you know, quite honestly. But, you know, the end of it is by the time he left there, you know, an hour, hour and a half later, you know, he had made an impact. And it was a similar mm -hmm. story you just described. Over the course of time, you know, it really became this thing that the kids looked forward to. And this was at an elementary school. Mm -hmm. But it was just, Great example, but I had never considered the fact that, you know, we send them up there and that they would run away because yeah. that's, that's the reality. That's the reality we face, and we have to understand that because a lot of times we don't understand it. We just don't We just know, and we have to look at and put the shoes from the perspective of people in our community, not mm -hmm. just the perspective. We need to be able to understand and empathize with what kids see. You yep. know, and the only time they see us is for enforcement. That is not a good mm -hmm. way for us to make. Changes. We have to be able to break things down, the barriers down, get it down on the ground level and make those connections in a positive way. Mm hundred -hmm. percent. So um, the Verity family. So this, this next question is right up your guys alley being mm -hmm. law enforcement, being, being great parents, uh, being educators to a lot of kids in the area. And then we're going to go around from there to, uh, you know, for everybody to get a chance to answer this question. But um, it actually came from, um, you know, some of our littles and their parents, actually. So what can our mentors and parents do to educate our littles on how to be more active in the community? And not just in our community, but how can they go and be comfortable approaching an officer um, if they are, like we were just talking about, the first time they see an officer come into their school, they're all running away or they're all, you know, assuming that someone's in trouble. You know, how do we break that and how do we get the parents and the mentors to, to get their kids to be used to seeing an officer in a good spotlight, unlike, you know, we're possibly seeing on the news or what they're hearing from their friends. So, um, you know, the Verities, if you want to get started um, and then we'll kind of go go back around and uh, 
and on hopefully a little bit more on a very positive note here because this is a great question for on how what we can actually be active and do out of this meeting. Yeah, yeah. ladies first. <laughs> Thank you. So just picking up off of the last question, you know, Hey Blue believes that effective collaboration begins with connection. It begins with us listening to the desires and wants of the people in the communities that are being served by police officers. We can't develop solutions. We can't solve problems without first centering that experience. You know, that's mm -hmm. where everything begins. Um, and we start with empathy, you know, empathizing that children might run away when they see <laughs> police officers to Chief Gillespie's point uh, that a negative association is a lot easier to build than a positive association is to our yeah. point. It mm -hmm. takes me one interaction with you to, to make a, a negative lasting impression. And it mm -hmm. takes repeated consistent trust building to build a positive connection. So we need police officers, police departments to show up every day with this idea that compassion and empathy will lead my way. I want to connect with you. I don't want you just to see me as the uniform who comes and to, again, to Elton's point, take something away or hurt someone that I love. I want you to know that I love you. I'm proud to be a part of this community. I want to serve you. I want to work with you. Um, and that's what Hey Blue does. Hey Blue says that we can do more to build lasting, profound, meaningful connections between community members, between <laughs> and police officers. And that speaks to filling that cup too for officers. It's really hard to function in a vacuum and to feel as though you're doing something for others all day, every day. And when you go out into the community, people are running away. Well, if we want police officers to connect to us, if we want police officers to want to be a part of our community, we have to find a place where it's okay to connect and where we can fill their cups and they can fill ours. You know, so if we're reading in classrooms and we're having fun and we're breaking down this idea that the person with the bulletproof vest and the gun likes bubbles too, and he rolled around with me on the carpet, well, I can relate to you now. And that police officer can relate to that kid. Yes. If you come with me and you join me on the garden and you sweat with me and you're planting some cucumbers, I know Chief Gillespie, he loves cucumbers and tomatoes. That's you right. know, I built a garden with him last week. That's right. You know, it, it takes more than this idea that these individual events will be enough to build lasting trust. We need to do it every single day. And that's what Hey Blue wants to do, partner with police departments like the Melbourne Police Department to say, I want to be with you, I want to stand next to you. I want to be your friend. You know, how often have you had a police officer say that to you in, in your lifetime? And we want kids to be able to say that. He's my friend, come meet my friend. You know, and, and, and those are the ideas of relatability and connection that, that we hope that um, we take away from these types of initiatives. And, and also, I think it's extremely important to note that it, it's amazing, like, when officers go into the community and they find out that they meet the, the people that make this community work and, that, and then they find out how amazing that these people are, the amazing things that they're doing. Like, you, you know, for me, like just when I met Alton, you know, and I was like, dude, you do what? <laughs> like, I'm, Everything. I'm, I'm, Everything. How do you do all that you do? And I'm like, that is absolutely amazing. And then I met Jeremy and I saw everything that Jeremy was doing and so many other people in communities. And I didn't know that at first, that, that wasn't my journey, you know, but when we started the school and you start meeting people that they say, you know, it's, it's one thing when a person just sits back, but it's another thing when somebody raises their hand, whether they're six, seven, eight, nine, ten, 10, or when they're older and they say, you know what, this is, this is the impact that I want to have in the community, you know, and, and for somebody to turn around and say, I see that. I see you. And more importantly, I believe in you, which is huge. And I have officers come into communities and say, into their community, into Melbourne, into Coco, and say, hey, talk to me. Tell me what's going on. What? Really? Those are the things that's going on? That I believe in you. I believe that we can work together. And I believe that we can come and, and do something together as a force to be reckoned with. That is absolutely amazing. 
Let's encourage our kids to be fierce. To be <laughs> fierce. Let's encourage yes. them to reach out to police departments yes. and, and to create connections on their own terms. To yes. say, come and join us in our community. We, we want to create this new initiative. We'd love to join you at the next community council meeting. We have yes. some ideas that we want to share with you. These are things that you know our littles and, and our bigs and their parents can help to engage and motivate children to do and, and individuals within the community. Um, in my experience, police officers, police departments want to hear what we have to say. Yes. Um, and, and we need to be brave and be willing to speak up when we need to. And you know, there's one five letter word that gets it all started. And that simply is hello. Yeah. Yes. Not say hello. Just start there. Hello. I would be shocked if you said hello and you didn't get a hello back. <laughs> Absolutely shocked. You let Mr. John know, all right? <laughs> yeah, and and that's a you know great point. I look back on when I, I was a little kid, uh, you know, before being adopted, I grew up in the poor, you know, area of town of in, in Delaware. And, you know, my grandmother raised me up until about 10 years old and she's old school, you know, you know, grandma grew up in the you know, twenties, thirties, and she used to threaten me. Oh, I'll call the cops on you. If you, if you eat too much cereal, I'm going to call the cops on you on that. And I'm, ha I'm happy parents aren't doing that anymore or as much. And it's, a, that's another thing I think parents can do is just pop in my head, uh, John, as you were telling your story of like, <laughs> you know, things that we need to be positive about it. And on the parent side, like, Hey, don't threaten. You're going to call the cops on your kid. Like that's, that's going to terrify him. Like I was terrified of cops. I, up until I got pulled over for the first time, I got so nervous. Um, I was chewing on a pen and the officer was just laughing at me because he saw how nervous I was and he calmed me down a little bit. And, uh, you know, after that positive experience, it was all good. But um, even, even growing up, you know, where I was, I was terrified because I was always threatened to be, you know, have the cops called on me. But, um, you know, Mr. Edmund, you know, what can you say about, you know, the community and how they can reach out to the officers and what can parents and mentors of, you know, of youth do to help bridge that gap? Um, so I, I think, I think, I, I think the answering that question is really difficult as much as yes. I love to, um, as much as I love to end it on a high note, it's hard for me to answer this question, yeah. um, with a super happy bubbly answer, um, <laughs> because in many of the communities that I serve, the relationship between law enforcement and the community has been severed. Yeah. Um, and there is an immense lack of trust um, uh, when it comes to law enforcement and how the average person um, feels about them. Um, but, you know, I think that, you know, we can really start with uh, educators. We can start with the different um, community connections that the parents and the children in the community have to come into contact with. Um, uh, parents and children have to go to the store. Um, and so when Coco PD does shop with a cop um, in the beginning of the, the school year, um, where the officers will take some kids and get school, school supplies, help th take them around the store, shop with them, in, you know, different efforts like that are really helpful. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, meet them, uh, you know, when, when, when people are met where they are uh, mm -hmm. in the stores and at the schools um, and have no choice but to um, confront officers in a positive and non-confrontational way, um, yep. it really helps to bridge the gap. Um, but I think, it's, I think it's really difficult um, to expect some communities um, to be the ones to initiate um, the, the, the bridging of the gap of the gap, <laughs> I'm sorry, mm -hmm. um, and that connection, unfortunately. No, and you're, you're right. It, you know, it's not like we're gonna solve this issue with this, this conversation and everything's gonna be great tomorrow. It, and we can't take giant leaps. We're gonna have to take baby steps over through this process. And in some areas, yeah, you're right. It, it can happen tomorrow. It's already happening. It's been in the process for five, 10, 15 years already, but you're right. In other communities, you know, we need to start those steps or come up with creative ways that community will actually respond to. So you're, you're, you're right. It, it's not a negative note. It, I still think it's a positive note because we understand what we need to do. We just need to actually go out and act on it and Absolutely. on both sides. So, um, and that's a perfect transition to, uh, you know, chief David here. It, 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 I, I think, 
you are already doing amazing things in Melbourne. Um, I know the Melbourne area is one of our biggest areas for Pigs in Blue. Uh, they've always been big supporters of the initiative. So it was, it was great to have you on for this. But on the other end, you know, in these areas that Alton was talking about that, you know, struggle a little bit more in trusting the officers, what things do you think you could do to help bridge that gap uh, moving forward? Yeah, so um, Alton has it right on, you know, he, he hit the nail on the head that, you know, these challenging situations, it's nice to say when you're in elementary school, you got a captive audience, you got these kids and they see an officer and, you know, that's a great thing. And I tell you, one of the most rewarding things I ever did today was go to school and read to a first grade class and, you know, just what I got out of that. And and so it was, it's very rewarding. But that's a, that's an audience, and in a way, that's kind of easy. If the challenge is to get your older uh, population, you know, your teenagers, your young adults, and, you know, where they had personal experiences that weren't real positive, and how do we make an impact there? And so it's not simple, or else we would have figured this out many years ago, right? So yeah. what we do is we have to hit this from many different angles. We have to start young, but we have to continue it. Uh, and we have to have different programs to target different populations in the community or age groups, rather, you know, because what we do is be able to address what's important to teenagers, what's important to young adults. I've gone to uh, 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 programs where, you know, I just talk to them about what it's like to be, you know, if you get stopped by the police, what are the police looking for? What are the what are the impacts of, of what, you know, we're facing? And what should they and, and just listen to them and ask questions about it. Let them ask questions about me and how we act on a traffic stop and why. And, you know, listen to what their concerns are as well. And so it's a dialogue. And it's also about having some legitimate, tough decisions and conversations about things that make people very uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And race is one of those. And when we talk about start talking about race, a lot of people either want to shirk it, they want to, they want to, you know, just kind of avoid it because it's a touchy subject in our country. Mm -hmm. But we have the courage to have these conversations, and we have to have the ability to be able to look at something from a different perspective, other than our own. Mm -hmm. And some of the things I will tell you that we do, you know, we do the um, the Explorer program. It's a, you know, we young young adults. You have to be 16. And you can join with the police department on one night a week and you start to learn different facets of policing. A lot of times it's a way to become uh, involved in, in a career in law enforcement. Um, we have our community academy for, you know, our, our adults and uh, young adults to, to older adults and be able to explain to them the different facets of police work. We're getting the use of force and the factors that come into play, the obstacles, the challenges. And what are the considerations that you have to be thinking about during those encounters? And so then we also have um, the ride along program. And and so when I got here, we had stopped the ride along program and we had stopped the community academy. Well, one of the things I recognized is we needed to start those back up. And so uh, right before our community, academy, the first one we've had in years, and then, you know, we got COVID. So we're on kind of a hiatus now, but we also started a ride program, and I think that's a very effective program for people to come out and ride with an officer, especially if it's somebody that, that patrols your neighborhood, to be able to ask questions, and ask, really kind of, you know, understand the dynamic of what an officer is thinking and encountering, you know, but those programs aren't for everybody, and we got to recognize that. They're very effective, they have a lot of value, not for everybody, and, and that's people that really are the most reluctant to engage that becomes the challenge right that's the challenge for sure those are the people that we really need to work on and we do it through in Melbourne through our community uh, leaders in the community that really help facilitate these interactions through a variety of different programs whether it's club esteem whether it's through the rec department go to uh, live with women event, events, uh, be, take some of from uh, drug seizures and give back to the community to help fund some community programs. Um, all these help 
towards the overall goal. But we cannot stop and hesitate. We have to be going full bore every day. And it can't be just the chief or one or two people in the eight got a reverberate mm-hmm. group. All the department. Everybody has to understand. You got to believe it and you got to know why it's important to the overall mission of what we do. We're only effective if our communities tell us to report crime, going to, going to uh, help work with us to identify perpetrators that is going to give us information and do our job. I'm blessed. I work in a community that is very embracing of its police department. And I, I can tell you, I will never, never take that for granted for the, the relationship that with the people in our community. But what for sure. Build on it and make it more effective than we already are. And, and we always have. Yeah, and um, so I, I do know uh, Mr. Edmund here needs to, to head out, so I'm going to let uh, him jump off the call, and then uh, I'll, I guess I'll wrap it up from there. Thank you, uh, Thank Alton, you so for much. joining us. I will see you on Friday for our story time. Awesome. We're going to go put on his cape <laughs> and <laughs> go save the community. <laughs> Thank you so much for the opportunity. I appreciate you. Y'all have a good night. You too, sir. Thank you. But, uh, yeah, no, I – and. You know, Chief David, you're you're 100 right. I love um, what they're doing here in Orlando. Um, Chief Rowland and Chief Mina, you know, are requiring their new recruits to get out in their community while they're in while they're recruits and actually get to know the communities and the business owners and you know the people who actually day to day live where they're going to be patrolling. So when they actually become you know officers, they already know everybody and they already have a relationship with everybody in the community. So I, I, I do want to thank all of you for joining. I know some of us uh, some some of our group had to jump off early to go to work. Um, but, you know, we can't have end this conversation here. This is something that we need to continue down the road. Uh, this is just, you know, one step of the process, I believe. And I think mm-hmm. you know, all of us do a great job of, you know, in our respective communities of leading um, in our own way. So now we seem to go out and actually, you know, help our communities in a different way and continue these conversations going and continue these relationships going. So, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I'd love for Glenn and I to go out and, you know, meet with, uh, you know, Chief David and your team out there. And, you know, John, I still need to go visit your guys' school. It's amazing. Um, loving that. You guys motivated me to put a, a tomato and, and cucumber garden in my backyard. Right. So I got one for the last two months in my backyard now. <laughs> so, so I just want to say thank you guys to everybody that joined on. Uh, maybe we can do this again down the road in, you know, in a couple of weeks or a month or so, just depending on how everything pans out. But uh, I just want to say, stay safe, everybody out there. Stay healthy. Uh, Chief David, I hope yeah, you and the rest of your team um, you know, stay, stay safe and do great work out in the community. So thank you again for everything you do. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank I appreciate you. you. Uh, you too. <laughs>